Beth Logans was a 48-year-old wife, mother, and grandmother who was diagnosed with leukemia in 2019. I don't know about you guys, but I, if I got that diagnosis, I would be very heartbroken and very scared, and so was she. It was said that the news came as a shock to her, because she, of course nobody really expects that, and she started chemotherapy treatment. So at one point, the drugs sent her into liver failure, and the doctors told her she only had about a 15% chance of surviving. Then came a bone marrow transplant, which involved many long trips to the hospital in Detroit, but she's lucky to call herself, or very blessed to call herself, a survivor. She said to a local newspaper, I have so much to be thankful for. I am thankful that God brought me through this, and I am thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ for his comfort and his calming of my fears. I'm thankful to him for the time he has extended to me. I am thankful for my family and the people I have met because of my illness, the doctors, the nurses, the patients and their families. I am thankful for the prayers of the people from many churches, people I don't even know. Yes, she had a very optimistic outlook, but this isn't to say that she didn't have her challenges. Yes, there are many times in which she was frustrated and she was sad, but she was very determined not to let anger and bitterness get a hold of her. Because, you know, there are many times in which you could be angry and bitter at God, saying, how could you let this happen to me? But look what she said. She said, I had to reset my negative thinking many times a day to concentrate on the blessings I have been given and not the ones I wouldn't get. I know my leukemia did not happen by random chance. And with that realization, I set a goal for myself to walk this path that God has chosen for me and to bring him honor and glory, whether by living or dying. That's my heart's desire. I determined to choose joy. I'd say to anyone in a similar situation, choose joy. I think to a lot of people out there, especially if they're not religious or they're not Christian, this is a very hard pill to swallow, right? If you get leukemia, you get cancer, you get AIDS, whatever the case, you'd be very terrified and you would have no more hope in life. But yet, why is it that women like Beth has so much joy? Well, it's very simple because she recognizes that she is a sinner who's going to be judged for her sins, who will end up in hell for all eternity. But yet the love of God stepped in to take care of her sins on the cross so that she can be forgiven and she can have eternal life and that she can be raised just like Jesus was raised on the third day. That's the reason why she can have so much hope is because she has eternal life. And I don't know about you brothers, but that is a great realization to have. So no matter how bad life gets, you know what she can say to herself? She can say it could be so much worse because I could be in hell right now but yet I have eternal life, so I have every reason to be joyful. See, this is exactly what the gospel is. Jesus taught it 2,000 years ago, and he said that if you really understand what the gospel is, you should be filled with so much joy, no matter what happens to you in this life. And that's what we're gonna look at in today's passage today, in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 24. So that's where you need to be, everybody. So once again, the gospel of Luke is a gospel, and a gospel basically means good news because it tells the good news about how Jesus came into the world, how he fulfilled Old Testament prophecy of a coming Savior who is going to reverse sin so that we can be redeemed, we can be rescued, we can have eternal life. That's really what Jesus' life was all about. So if you remember last week, Jesus sends 70 of his disciples to go out to do evangelism, short-term missions, right? Do we remember that? It wasn't really that long ago. So this week, in this passage we're going to look at today, we see how the 70 returned from their short-term mission and they were filled with so much joy, saying hallelujah. People were healed, people heard the gospel, people were being saved, and they were just so happy. You see, that's one of the great reasons why we should do evangelism, because we are filled with so much joy when we share the gospel with people all around. Yeah, Jesus says that he shows us they're filled with joy, but then we should be filled with joy as well. And that's really the main point of today's passage. So let's look at it together. 
God shows us three powerful reasons why we should not just believe in the gospel, but be overjoyed in the gospel, to rejoice in the gospel. So let's look at point number one. We should rejoice in the gospel because it displays God's power. In the gospel, we have God's power available to us. If you're asking, what do you mean by that, Pastor Steve? I'll explain that to you right now. We see that in verses 17 to 20. Let's look at it together. So in verse 17, Luke says this, continuing from last week. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So like I said, they all came back from their short-term mission and they were so happy because they were seeing miracles being performed, people hearing the gospel and coming to repentance and faith. And they were so impressed that they actually had God's power working through them to cast out demons. They're like, Jesus, we're doing it just like you did. Great. God allowed that to happen. Remember, that was a period in which we saw a lot of miracles happening in Jesus' day because that's when the gospel revelation was coming in. So it was pretty much God proving to the people, this is God's message. You need to listen to it. Oh, Jesus was happy for sure. He said in verse 18, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Okay, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't exactly know what he means by this. Some people think that it talks about when Satan was originally banished from heaven. This was before creation, you know, when he took a third of the angels with him. But nevertheless, anytime a sinner is saved, he is taken out of the kingdom of Satan and into the kingdom of God. So it's always like a big blow to Satan's kingdom whenever somebody gets saved. But then we know eventually Satan is going to be defeated. He's going to be judged and he will be cast into the lake of fire forever. So his evil is not going to prevail permanently. It's, it's temporary. It's going to eventually come to an end. So Jesus was telling them, hey, see, this is what you got. I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. So Jesus is saying, yeah, I have given you power. I've given you the power so that you can cast out demons. I've given you the power so that Satan does not harm you. And that's really why we should be so confident when we're in Jesus, because God gives us so much power. I mean, even if he doesn't give us the power to heal people, cast out demons, do you know what, what is the biggest power that God has given us? The biggest power that God has given us is over death. Because if God were to judge us, he says, you die and you'll end up in hell. But he says, you're going to have the power to resurrect someday. You see, Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, this is the reason why he was so, you know, excited about the gospel. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. You hear that? For salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But Jesus was telling them, whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you get so excited about your miracles and about healing people, don't get so excited just because you have power to heal people and cast out demons. I know this seems so fun in some ways, but in verse 20, he says, do not rejoice in this. Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. That's the reason why we should rejoice. I mean, if God ever gives you power to heal somebody, if that ever happens, I mean, great, God bless you. But he says, don't, you know, really actively seek after that. Don't, you know, have that to be like your biggest joy in life. He says, rejoice because your names are written in heaven's book of life. Yeah, that's the reason why you should rejoice. You have power over death. God has given you the Holy Spirit so you can have the power to live a holy Christian life so that Satan can never have his way with you, just like he does with those pagans who don't know God. That's why you should be excited. So the whole lesson behind point number one is this. In the gospel, we have access to God's power. So are you excited about that? Are you excited that you have power over death? Because that excites me every single day. Are you utilizing it to the best of your ability? Don't you realize, guys, that you have the Holy Spirit if you're a Christian? And that with the Holy Spirit, he gives you so much privileges and so much power. But that's not the only reason why we should be excited about the gospel. Let's look at point number two. We should rejoice in the gospel because it displays God's wisdom. 
So in the gospel, we see the wisdom of God so magnified in it. So I'm going to explain this right now. Verses 21 and 22. So Jesus continues and says this. Don't you get excited every time Jesus says something in the Bible? Look what he says in verse 21. At that very time, Jesus rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and says, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was pleasing in your sight. Jesus was filled with so much joy. You know, it's a, it's a great thing when people are being saved and they're entering into the kingdom because God's plan was being fulfilled. You know what brought Jesus the most joy? Was when the work of the Father in heaven was being accomplished. I know you guys, you have a lot of things in your life that makes you happy and brings you joy, but Jesus said, what brings me the most joy is when my Father's plan is being accomplished every single day. He rejoices in the glory of God. And I can honestly say, me too. I do get very excited when God's plan is being accomplished. But you know what's very interesting about salvation? Look what he says here. I'm going to read it one more time. He says, Father, I praise you that you have hidden these things from the wise and have revealed them to infants. See, I told you. God is the one we know because even the apostles talked about it. He's the one who elects people, remember? He elects them. He calls them into the faith. He uh, regenerates them, which means that he, you know, causes them to be born again. And then uh, eventually he glorifies them in the last day. So this is all the work of God. But then how exactly does he do this? I mean, to whom does he do it to? It's very interesting because he says, I don't call mostly the rich people. I don't call mostly the famous people. I don't call mostly all the educated rabbis and teachers. Isn't that very interesting? He says, I've re revealed this information to infants, people who are not self-righteous, people who are not proud, but people who are like infants. You know, they're humble, they're dependent, they need help, they recognize that they need a savior. See, Paul even talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 26 to 30, we saw this together. We, remember I taught this to you guys? He said, For consider your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God chose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Why? So that no man may boast before God. So this is basically saying that if God hadn't stepped in, to choose and to call us. Did you know nobody in the world could actually come to salvation? Because a lot of people think, oh, I came to salvation because God, or I chose God. I understood the gospel, so I came to God. Well, yeah, I mean, in many ways that is true. But did you know before that, God was working in your heart to bring you to salvation? And he says here that, you know, there's so many people in the world who are smart, They've been to Harvard, they've been to Stanford, they're scientists, they're lawyers. Did you know there are actually a lot of them? Even if you try to reason the proofs of Christianity with them, it's like they just don't get it. They don't believe in the gospel. And we know because Jesus told us that, because they've been blinded by their sin, that because of their sinfulness, they just cannot see the truth of the gospel. So it's God who is the one who reveals the gospel to us so that we can believe. So why is this so important? It's very important because of this. Because if you claim to be a Christian today, all glory is, is to God for your salvation. So you can never say, you know, I'm the one who discovered the truth. I'm the one who figured it out. No, you got to humble yourself. God says he revealed it to you so that you can discover the truth. He worked in you through the Holy Spirit. So that's the reason why we should praise God and say, God, without you, I have no hope. You're the one who revealed it to me so I can be saved. You see in verse 22, Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father and who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. 
Jesus was saying, I'm the one who reveals the truth to people. I'm the one who revealed the truth to you. So the whole lesson behind point number two is this. Salvation is something that we cannot discover through figuring it out on our own. Because a lot of people in the world, they try to, you know, figure out salvation on their own thinking, oh, this is the way to God. This is the way to God. This is how you get right with God. But God is saying here, it's only because of God's mercy that you are able to see the truth. I want to stress this again because, you know, sometimes people think, oh, I, because I'm a Christian and I know the truth of the gospel, I must be smarter than that other person there. Well, not necessarily. Because remember, like I said, there's a lot of smart people out there who don't believe in the gospel. And you know the reason why is because God has not revealed the truth to them so that they can be saved. But if we're here today and we believe in the gospel, like we really believe in it, that's because God has shown mercy to us to open up our eyes to see the truth of the gospel. And that is why we should say, praise you, God, for you're so merciful to me. So that's something I want you to take away, that in his wisdom, that's how God designed salvation. But there's also another reason why we should rejoice in the gospel. And this is the third and last point today. We should rejoice in the gospel because it displays God's blessing. Ooh, this is a big one. Oh yeah, God's blessing. Let's look at that, verse 23. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you, that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see and did not see them and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. So Jesus kind of said to his disciples privately, he says, you guys are so blessed. Do you know why? He said, it's very simple because you are seeing things right now that the Old Testament prophets and kings Believers in the Old Testament wish they saw back in their old time. Wow, that is something. So he was saying here, I'm not just another rabbi. I'm not just like another prophet. I'm actually the son of God, the Messiah that the Old Testament prophets were saying would come into this world for your salvation. So he's saying right here that you're seeing something truly spectacular. Because the Old Testament people wish they would have seen me. They wanted to see me. They were looking for me. They were praying to God saying, when is Messiah coming? But he, he didn't come during their lifetime because it wasn't in God's plan. But he says, you have seen it right now. You know the revelation of the gospel. So you are so blessed. You remember I read earlier, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. He says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, they made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ. Oh yeah, see even Peter recognized the Old Testament, the writers, they were even looking for Jesus to come, but yet he didn't come. You see at that time, they were saved, not because they followed the Ten Commandments, or went through the rituals, they were saved because they believed in the promises of God, promises to eventually do good to them eternally, to bring them into the promised land. But they didn't have this picture of the you know, actual face of Jesus. It's not like they're like, oh, I see the picture of Jesus and I see what he's gonna do like you know, a thousand years later. It wasn't like that. They just knew something was going to happen to take care of their sins. And you know what God said to them? Trust in me. Whether it's Abraham, whether it's Noah, whether it's Adam, whether it's Jeremiah, whether it was Ezekiel, whether it was Moses. He just said, follow me, trust in me. And that's what they did. And that's why they went to heaven. But to us, we know the full picture right now because we saw what Jesus Christ did. So what he did on the cross took care of the sins and not just us, but even the people in the Old Testament. So that's a reason why we should rejoice. So the whole lesson behind point number three, we have so much in the Bible now so that we can really grow so much more as a Christian than anybody in the Old Testament times. Did you know that? 
Because God has given us so much more wisdom, so much more of the will of God so that we can be blessed. So if we know these things, we have an obligation to follow it. Mm -hmm. Don't take it for granted. Don't think, oh, Jesus, great. That's a nice story. That's not the way we should think. Remember, the Old Testament prophets, they got excited over it. They're like, wow, I'm looking for Messiah. Imagine how these people 2,000 years ago felt about that. They're like, wow, Messiah's here. I don't know about you guys, but if you claim to be a Christian, one day you are actually going to see Messiah too. This same Jesus right here. So in conclusion, once again, the gospel displays God's power, his wisdom, and his blessing. And that's the reason why we should believe in it and we should really rejoice and be happy in it. Because God's salvation is really so great. So I want to ask you guys, like I've been saying week after week, I don't know, you know if you have really invested your heart in the gospel, into the message, but God says it's a wonderful thing. He has so much blessings. It's not just rescuing you out of the pits of hell like a lake of fire, but there's just so much more to that. It's the source of all rejoicing. So if you have not believed, then use today to believe. Turn from your sin and place your faith in Christ. But remember, if you're still alive, you still always have another chance to repent and to get right with God. So throughout your life, there's always going to be ups and downs, and then um, you're going to get times in which you're distracted by the things of the world. You know, all those things out there that distract you. In those moments, you got to watch out because they, what Satan wants to do is he wants to take your attention away from the gospel so that you don't focus on Christ. But Jesus says, continue to study the gospel. Rejoice in it because that is really what's going to bring so much power to your Christian life. You know, I know that there's a lot of Christians out there who are not really as passionate about their faith. And do you know the reason why that is? And I'm not talking about false converts, you know, like hypocrites who are going to end up in hell. I'm even talking about actual real Christians. Sometimes they do get kind of demotivated or not as excited. Do you know why? It's because they have taken their eyes off the gospel. They have not had time to really rethink and to meditate on, oh, how great the gospel is, how great this thing is. Because if you're really filled with the gospel, that is really going to cause you to have so much power in your Christian life and you are going to obey God. So I want to encourage you, keep your eyes on the gospel because that is really what's going to drive your Christian faith. Father, we pray to thank you for reminding us through your son about the good news of the gospel. There are times in which we can be distracted, times in which we can lose hope because of the persecution or because of the challenges of this world. But we pray, Lord, that we can rejoice just like you did, that whenever the gospel spread, God's kingdom work is prevailing and we should have all joy. Let us continue in our faith knowing that it is a blessed faith. That at the end of the tunnel, there is eternal life waiting for us. And that should get us through any hard times that we encounter in life. So yes, whenever we are down, let us remember the gospel so that it can fill us with excitement so that we can obey you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.